So when do you actually become an artist or a designer? When can you label yourself as creative? You don't get handed a sash declaring it, and no one will knight you with a paintbrush. It just kind of happens. Today, we're discussing the transition from student to professional on First You Hustle, a podcast from the Columbus College of Art and Design, and to help budding creative professionals put their expertise to use. So I didn't take advantage of the situation while I was there, which was, you know, it's school, I'm paying to be here, you know, it's my job to take advantage of this opportunity. I'm Jordan Bell, and that's today's guest, Marshall Shorts. I am the founder, CEO, creative in chief of Artfluential. Our lesson in this episode is about getting into the professional mindset. My conversation with Marshall, though, covers a lot more, including issues of diversity in the arts, how the hustle continues after graduation, and things you can be doing now as a student to focus yourself. And I'm like, I got to do something, you know, and instead of complaining about it, create the situation that you want to you want to see happen. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of First You Hustle. My guest today is Marshall Shorts. He's someone that you may have met as his annual conference series, the Creative Control Fest, takes place on campus. He's taught at CCAD, and he's a frequent collaborator with classes and student groups. We talked for a long time, and today you'll only hear a few bits. I'm saving the parts of our conversation about his entrepreneurial efforts for later episodes when we revisit that topic. Today, we're focusing on his journey as a professional and how that started long before CCAD. Something highly admirable about Mr. Shorts is he looks at barriers as challenges, not as hindrances. Much of his circumstance is created by his willingness to take on challenge and always keep hustling. As best I can, I'll try to assess that into action steps that you can take to help you embrace your professional self and map out a road to success. Let's jump into our conversation where we begin by understanding a little bit more about his conference series, Creative Control Fest. Creative Control Fest is really about... um Highlighting, empowering, fostering conversations around inclusion um, and uh, diversity, um, particularly from a racial and ethnic diversity within creative industry. So as a student in school, you know, CCAD at the time, I found myself, you know, maybe one of, if two, maybe sometimes the only African-American uh, in a class at any given time. And then once I graduated, kind of found out that that was happening more often in the professional world. And so we wanted to kind of build a platform that would uh, raise, a rare, uh, raise awareness around um, that issue. And then um, not just raise awareness, but, you know, kind of bridge the gap, you know. Um, what happens when you tend to get isolated is you don't know you're not in the industry. You're just kind of doing your thing. And so we wanted to, you know, kind of build with agencies, build with companies um, and let them know that creators of color are uh, out here, you know, doing quality work um, and also share resources. So we kind of say it's a creative conference put on by creators of color, um, which means that it's not just for creators of color, but it is a safe space for creative color to be highlighted and um, present it Um, but we welcome anybody who wants to engage in that dialogue who wants to bring and share resources and strategies so we've had speakers from all over the the country and world at this point from different nationalities and races and so uh it's really kind of taking on a life of its own this year we grew our partnerships with ccad and the columbus museum of art um, and of course the lincoln theater where we've been for the last few years and uh it's it's, you know, the the audience grows and gets more diverse. This issue of diversity in arts is an issue everywhere art exists. Creative Control Fest aims to take a small bite of that conversation, but nonetheless, Marshall is optimistic about the direction it's heading. There has been progress, and, and I think even at a surface level, I, I think it's been progress. I, I wouldn't say much deeper than that because there's still this problem, but I think, if, and when I say surface, I mean that I think people are more aware um, and I can't attribute that solely to Creative Con- Control Fest. I think that um, the conversation within the last two or three years uh, around issues of inclusion, issues of racism, and, and, and uh, just the social political landscape, uh, people are just more aware and more sensitive to where they are. And I, I can, you know, I know when we started six years ago, it wasn't 
as as big of a conversation, particularly in the creative industries like um, and now I see that this conversation is happening in the design and in the creative industries a lot more than when we started out six years ago. So um, I think in that regard, there's been a lot of progress in terms of awareness. I think, you know, the next step is really trying to look at the practices. Um, and when you really get to talking about like people working in their industries and creating and making a living, you know, how do we make sure that those spaces are actually more inclusive? If you look at the agencies, you know, what is what does the agency look like? You know what I mean? And um, I think there's still a lot of work to do there. Jumping back in time a little, Marshall discussed his reaction to looking around the classroom and seeing that there weren't too many students that looked like him. How I reacted, and I had some very like salient experiences, like when I first got to CCAD that were like really like, whoa. There were times I wanted to give up and like, hey, this is not for me. My reaction to that was, you know, to get become more active. So I became an RA, joined a, a fraternity um, that was historically black, and that opened me up to kind of seeing what other campuses do around diversity and multiculturalism and, you know, was able to bring some of that programming to CCAD. Um, so my reaction was to kind of like be the change I didn't see, I guess, you know, so I saw a need and I wanted to do what I could as a student. And I'm not saying that was easy. Um, and it was a learning curve I'm still, you know, I was always learning, but um, I think that opened the door for what is now like BSLA, um, Black Student Leadership Association. At the time it was ACA and it's one of the longest student run groups um, at CCAD. So that was all kind of cultivated when we were there and it was just like a, a handful of us. Uh, and it's kind of great to see that still going on. So I feel like, you know, um, if, if you're thinking about like, if you're feeling that kind of way, you know, uh, the fight or flight kind of mode to kick in, I think I chose to kind of stay and fight and, and I struggled through it. And, um, I think, you know, that led to some of the stuff I do now. That group you mentioned, BSLA, the Black Student Leadership Association, still exists on campus, and Marshall still interacts with that group. Similarly, CCAD Queer Alliance, Empowering Feminists on Campus, and International Student Association are all groups where students of a similar stripe can connect and advocate. These are groups based on race, gender, culture, and you might not think of them as professional groups like you do with the collectives that are on campus, where the aim is to foster skills in a specific profession, but these groups are essential to professional development. As Marshall found... You either navigate the landscape as you found it, or you seek to make it change. These groups help you do either. Marshall's instinct to be active, to always be creating, to not back down against challenges has deep roots. He discussed where his hustle mentality first originated. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been, I guess, a hustler, entrepreneur since I can remember. I've always wanted to have my own business. Um, I think I sold like a picture in fifth grade. I think it was fifth grade and I didn't I didn't wasn't trying to sell it right I, I was doing what most art kids do and draw in class and a friend of mine uh, took it home and then uh, brought me and my other buddy like five dollars back and in fifth grade that was a lot of money penny candy stores were still around so uh, like we were kings you know five ten dollars a day just from drawing pictures and so it was like ah oh, I gotta do this you know and so uh, I think for me um that's kind of always been there. So um, it was just like, you know, I'm I'm not beholden to uh, someone telling me when and when I can't, you know, make a living or do for myself. Now, granted, that's not <laughs> always the easiest choice. Um, and I've definitely had different jobs and, you know, I'm not opposed to working for somebody else. But I think for me, you know, shut up and create. Um, it's just a kind of a personal mantra that I adopted and in like 06, 07, like, you know, um, I found myself after graduating, like without a job, without, you know, certain things. And I'm like, I got to do something, you know, and instead of complaining about it, uh, create the situation that you want to you want to see happen. And that might be harder because you might be pioneering that situation. You might be the I won't say the first, but you you know, it might not be a a space of cultivation for that. So your, your road might be a lot harder, but, um, I think, you know, the reward on the other side is always good. Cause you kind of built it, you know, if he could do it all over again, Marshall talks about how he could have been a better student. Oh man. It's a, so many things I wish I had done, like the focus. And I guess that's just 
you know, being young and not knowing, um, I feel like, you know, I, 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 I was more focused in class. Like some of the things I regret is like, like my grades, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like, you know, a lot of the stuff I had to kind of relearn and reteach myself. So I didn't take advantage of the situation while I was there, which was, you know, it's a school I'm paying to be here. You know, it's my job to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, and I still kind of came from that student model of like, you know, waiting somebody to teach me, waiting for somebody to teach me. Um, and then when I went back to teach at CCAD a couple of years ago, I just realized like, man, like I wasn't like a bad student, but I was like, I didn't, I didn't look at it like a transaction. I didn't look at it like, Hey, this is your business. This is your life. You know, um, you chose to be here. Um, so you, it's your job to, to take advantage of it. And so, um, I think, you know, that's the first thing is just kind of coming to that realization that if if students can like view themselves as like a professional, you know what I mean? Like I'm a I'm a new professional in in the world and like I got to make this what I'm going to make it. And um, and if you take on that mentality, like then um, it's less of a, you know, this teacher student situation. It's like I'm a contributing person to this situation. So my ideas matter, you know, it's a collaboration and as opposed to like, I just show up and I work for this grade. I still freelance and stuff in school, but I probably would have took it a lot more serious and hustled a lot more in that regard in terms of cultivating relationships. So with that, his advice for students today, I would say um, this is your opportunity to to take advantage of your youth and your creativity. Um, I think as a student, uh, you, you get a pass in terms of like, you know, people opening that door for you because uh, people want to help. I think um, if I were to talk to myself, I would say take advantage of those opportunities more. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, don't be afraid to ask too many questions. Right. Um, because <laughs> and I hate to say it like this as a student, um, most like professionals or adults won't see you as a threat. Um, so that's your, if I go to some agencies and I'm like, Hey, I want to, you know, tell me about how you do this. They're going to be like, why are you asking? You know, like you, you're, you know, you, they might look at you more as competition, but as a student, as a young person, like, like people are willing to just kind of show you the ropes because they want to mentor you. They want to pass that knowledge on. Um, but a lot of times they don't have time to kind of wait or find you. You know, I think if I was to talk to a student, it's like find those people whose work you look up to locally and set up a meeting with them and ask them questions, shadow them, you know, do work for them, intern with them, do whatever you got to do to get that information while you're a student or while you're young and, uh, you know, take advantage of that and then take advantage of being a student. <laughs> CCAD has a lot of great resources right now, like 3D printers and um, laser cutters. And if I had all that, like, I would be running a couple of businesses out of there right now. So I know some students that are doing that, but um, yeah, I, I would be taking advantage of all of those resources. Here's a few things you can do as a student to help push you into the mindset of navigating your college experience like a professional in training and not a student who just needs to pass. One, inventory your skills. If you were a business, and it's kind of good to think of yourself as a business. I mean, we all have something to offer. We're looking for someone to pay us for those skills. Often that's through employment, but it's at its base, it's someone that's essentially purchasing or renting your skill set. So therefore, know what's in your mental skills shelves. You know, what's in your inventory? What can you do? What can you not do? How good are you at specific skills? How can you become better? Which skills are more likely to get you a job? All of these questions help you identify your marketability and the quality of your, quote, inventory, end quote. Answering those questions involves looking at your past and trying as best you can to peer into the future. Connecting with professionals in the field currently is a good way to see a little further down the road. Not too far, but maybe into the landscape of the work environment you'll be entering right after graduation. Sit down with these contacts and absorb information. As Marshall mentioned in our interview, this is a lot easier to do when you're a doe-eyed student who is really curious. Learn about what it takes to work in your field of interest, then reflect on your current abilities, 
and what shakes out will fall into three categories. A. Things you know, are good at, and can continue to improve. B. Things you know in theory, but aren't good at practically, and need to identify a plan for improvement. C. Things you don't know, and need to identify a point of access to learn. This might be taking a class, self-training, or just practicing. 2. Be a rolling stone and gather no moss. Sitting on your inventory can make it go stale, and you've got to move them off the shelves. I'm sticking with this metaphor that your skills are a product and you yourself are a business. Get that product out there. The creative projects you work on as part of a class give you opportunities to specifically try and specifically fail at things you've identified you need to work on. And failing is good. Get rid of this notion that failing is bad. Consider this. Let's say you're destined to fail a certain number of times in your lifetime. But when and where those failures happen are not yet determined, just the number of times. Use your time as a student to clock in some great failures. It'll be way better now than messing up or falling flat when you're out there in the real world, so don't sweat trying something new. Shooting to improve. Coming up a little short. These are the best learning experiences. And employers don't mind hearing about your failed attempts, as long as they show ambition and or new understanding. What you'll find, though, is that you'll likely surprise yourself and end up succeeding anyway. The key is just trying and putting yourself out there and doing new things. The hardest thing to sell is yourself. This is number three. Another benefit to the inventory exercise is that you can better understand how to articulate your abilities. I see a lot of students confuse this for needing to talk at the level of an experienced professional, which is not what I'm saying. I'm saying take an accurate assessment of yourself. This will show when you can make statements about your strengths and interests and ask questions about weaknesses, uncertainties, or your curiosity. Don't be shy about questions. The answers will do a few things. First, it'll give you some newfound knowledge. Second, it may uncover new findings about your inventory. Maybe it reveals a skill you actually already have or a skill you need to acquire. And third, it builds rapport with the person you're speaking to. Most people love to mentor. They love seeing the, whoa, cool moment wash over someone, similar to how it washed over themselves years ago. People are more likely to help out those they connect with and have identified that are serious about this craft. And that brings me to number four, be serious about your craft. Creative professions are really cool and they're often highly underestimated. How often have you heard someone say, hey, maybe I should just quit my job and be an interior designer because they spotted a cool throw pillow at Ikea once, as though it's a realistic option that they could just stop their career and pick up interior design in a second. People often over-romanticize creative professions, think they're easier or more glamorous than they really are. The result is that there tends to be a guard up sometimes, especially in really highly competitive circles where... You know, someone who's in a hiring position defaults to thinking, this person, this candidate I'm seeing isn't really serious. Often they're actively seeking how they can quickly and widely weed out a lot of lukewarm, not serious candidates. This used to be justification for unpaid internships. The thinking being, if you're serious, you'll put in the time at the lowest rung of the ladder and work for no pay. But thankfully, the tide is turning a little on that thinking, and most employers realize that you're a human being and you need money, even if a judge had to tell them that. Also, in my opinion, sticking to your value as an artist or designer is more professional than caving to free work just for experience. But I'm digressing. Many employers look for signals that you won't be around very long because you don't want to hustle. You don't know what it takes to work in that industry. You don't want to grind. And being able to demonstrate that you are focusing on honing your skills, practicing and improving your abilities regularly, connecting with professionals, and having discussions about industry-related topics these are all great ways of getting that guard down and making someone see that you really are just like them. You're new, you're fresh, you're eager to prove something to the world. They were like that, and they'll recognize that in you as well. So get nerdy about it. As I think about the people I knew in college, and I studied media production, which included television, radio, video production, had a wide umbrella of career directions, including people who wanted to work in Hollywood, people who wanted to be broadcasters, writers, technical designers, you name it. You could really tell who was serious and who wasn't. I was into producing, and I'd often notice why I wasn't into other technical areas, which I may have found were fun and interesting, but certainly not to the degree these other people did. I mean, they knew model numbers, they'd argue about brands of lenses, they'd lament upgrades in a piece of software. And I don't mean you need to be a curmudgeon, but for example, my favorite director that I'd always collaborate with would say things like, whoa, look at this board that ESPN uses, it's a H5320, and I basically wouldn't care. I, I don't even know if that's a real model number, but... I had the things that I was nerdy about, and they were usually really boring producer stuff. But look at me, I'm not a director, and it wasn't because in an interview someone asked, which board does ESPN use? It's because if I didn't care enough to know intimately the equipment vital to the job, 
I didn't care about the job. And I didn't. I never even applied to those positions. And I wasn't passionate about it. I was knowledgeable about it. I could do it. If someone ran into the room and yelled, does anyone know how to direct a multi-camera studio show? I'd raise my hand. I know the technique. I know how to do it. I've done it before. But the person who lives and breathes this stuff and like that they do that will navigate through the job search much more smoothly than the person who is forcing themselves against the grain or put forward a lukewarm application, send in that portfolio that didn't show range, just show check boxes of I did this and I also did that. It's the difference between employers seeking out people who know how to do things. In that category, there are thousands for every one job versus those who really want to do those things. In that category, there are far fewer. Now is the time to take the steps to separate yourself from the pack. And one way to do that is by getting serious about your craft. And the fact that you do not inherently do it isn't a signal that you aren't cut out for it. It's definitely something you need to seek out and do, but just like exercising, it kind of becomes contagious. And the more you do it, the more you want to do it. It's something that might be tough, but once you get started, then it becomes a lot easier. So keep up with trends, new equipment, new tools, Read up on what is going on in the industry. Read profiles of people who have made great achievements in your field. Understand what it takes to be a professional so that when you meet people in your field, you can demonstrate that you have a lot of potential. You aren't just another person who is half in. And that's what this episode has been all about. Don't be half in. Be all in. As the great Ron Swanson once said, don't half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. Let's meet another member of the CCAD student affairs team. Since it is the time of year when you're thinking about what classes you're going to be taking next semester, you should probably get to know our newest academic advisor. My name's Allie Hayes. I am a new academic advisor at CCAD. I advise animation, fine arts, art history, and contemporary crafts, which is new as of this fall. Um, So my work with students is primarily helping them understand degree requirements and their academic plan, helping folks pick out classes um, and register for classes each semester add, drop, things like that. Um, I work with students when they're thinking about adding a minor or a concentration to see how that can fit into their plan. Um, And a lot of students come to the advising office with just general questions when they're not sure who to go to and we point them in the right direction. What's something you do to focus you that like makes you kind of able to think about, you know, taking on a a large load of work or you just need to kind of drain the batteries and kind of get back to neutral. What do you do to get focused? Yeah. Um, For me, getting focused has a lot to do with self-care and just making sure that I'm in the best headspace that I can be in to be Mm -hmm. able to tackle a new project. Um, For me, that looks like running usually. So um, blasting some music, going for a run, um, sometimes yoga or, you know, reading a book and drinking some tea. And then what's something you do to like get yourself really pumped up and high energy? Yeah, Um, definitely music. Um, Before interviewing at CCAD, I was listening to a lot of some of my like favorite childhood music. So a lot of NSYNC, just really upbeat um, pop music to feel kind of pumped and ready to tackle a new thing. Sometimes power poses too. I really kind of buy into the fact that your body language influences your perception. So um, to get ready for something, sometimes I'll do like the Wonder Woman pose for for two minutes or so just to feel really powerful going into something. And tell me about a time when you were job searching where you feel like something wasn't going very well. And maybe it turned out fine and maybe it didn't, but just like something where you're like, oops, I could have done that a little better. This is a hard one. I admittedly, when I was conducting my first job search after grad school, probably applied for 40 or 50 different jobs, um, which was just a whole lot. So early on, it was really hard to keep track of it. Um, And before I realized that I should be using like an Excel sheet and keeping track of when I had applied to something and if I'd heard back and what sort of thing um, and saving documents that I had sent in for submissions. Um, That was just a really kind of generally disorganized period. Um, And I've also had a couple of just strange interviews where I felt like I couldn't get a good read on the person. Um, One in particular, I was at a big conference interviewing for a lot of different positions and had just this one interviewer who 
like straight monotone the whole time. I couldn't pick up whether or not it was going well, and I feel like generally I have a good sense of that. Um, it felt like he was discouraging me from applying for the job, like he was highlighting all of the negative reasons, um, all of the things that I might not want or enjoy about the job. Ironically, I ended up not getting that job, but getting another job at the same institution and saw him very often and found out later on that he'd like me just fine. And that was how he spoke to people and engaged. Um, So it was just a good reminder that you should always put your best foot forward. I still wrote thank you notes and, you know, thanked him for his time, even though it felt really weird um, and ended up having a second interview with him at the conference and working in in the same division. So I was really glad that even though it had felt kind of off, I had still followed up in a kind of appropriate and professional way and and yeah. kept a good relationship there. It sounds like it, it was kind of in your head that it wasn't going well, where he was yeah. like, oh, this is fine, it's just the yeah. way he is. Yeah, that was just how he engaged with people, and it was a good reminder that not everyone is going to be really gregarious and fun and personable, and some folks, that's just not who they are, and that's not how they engage, and, and it doesn't mean it's going poorly. Yeah. The conference interview, I remember conference interviewing, and um, – it was yeah. It was like it would be late in the day, and you know, like that person just had twenty interviews. And I remember one where the person kept looking off into like the distance, like above my head and off to the you know left of my head. And I'm like, what are they looking at? Is there something going on over there? And then I had to like look and see what she was looking at, and then it was nothing. And then when I made eye contact with her, I was like, oh, now she thinks I think something's wrong with her because I looked at her staring at nothing, and it was just totally in my head, and it went all downhill from there. Yeah. So yeah, conferences can be rough. What did you want to be when you were little? When I was really little, I really wanted to be a vet, which I think is a very typical thing. It's like, a, I like animals, I will be a vet. And that's like the instant thought when you're a kid. Um, so I wanted to be a vet for a little while. And then right around like third or fourth grade, I thought I wanted to be a writer. And it changed a couple of other times after that. <laughs> I spoke with Taylor and I spoke with Mallory. And you know what they both wanted to be when they were little? Vets. Vets. <laughs> Everyone wants to be a vet. Because as guess. a kid, you're just like, I love animals. I want to work with animals all day. I will be a vet. Yeah. But then you get older and you start to think about all of the painful experiences that you're going to see animals go through. This is if great. If you're a vet. I'm going to change the question to, from what do you want to be to a little to why did you want to be a vet? <laughs> Yeah, I everyone, just everyone wanted to be, wants to be a vet. Yeah, but I, yeah, it is. Uh, you mentioned the um, it's the tough realization that like, oh, being a vet doesn't mean you get to hug animals all the time. No, it means sometimes you have to be there for really sad conversations with families, and sometimes you can't fix it. And animals are unhappy and they're in pain and they're not feeling well. And and then last question is, you mentioned you like to listen to music. Are you still listening to NSYNC? Is there something different <laughs> that you're listening to now? Uh, or what else are you consuming? You could talk about a book that you're reading or a recent movie or TV show that you're yeah. Into. Um, I have been working my way through the Fables comic book series right now. The library, the Columbus Library, actually has a really extensive collection of comics and graphic novels. So um, I've been kind of diving into that. And although I do love music and do listen to music pretty often, right now I've been listening to audiobooks for my commute. Um, so I'm, I've been listening to A Wrinkle in Time right now in kind of preparation for the movie coming out. So I've been really enjoying that. Um, and in terms of TV, I have been watching Avatar and Legend of Korra. I'm on a real, like, comics and, yeah. and animation kick right now. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for sitting down and answering mm-hmm. my questions. Thanks. And that's our episode today. Thanks for listening. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to whatever channel you're listening on. That may be on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. You can find us at facebook.com slash firstyouhustle. And episodes are also cross-posted to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash ccadedu. We'll see you again next time. Theme is Mr. Boogaloo by the Juanitos, Creative Commons license from the Free Music Archive.